much as uh, someone's living. Yes, in Frostbite 1. Right. Yeah. 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 We don't have these restrictions at all because these light maps uh, are fixed dynamically. So we can destroy a house and the light comes in. As I said, all the, all the lighting from the sun, we have a shadow plane casting shadows from the sun, basically. We also have that from the point lights. So we don't need to bake in any shadows anywhere. The only light maps you see here is all the indirect light. So there's no shadows baked. Or, or anything like that. All the shadows are dynamic. The only thing the light maps were scoring is the indirect light. That's why that's why in the scene you see these white areas here, because this area gets the skylight, but it gets light from the bounce from this area up to this. That's what you're seeing here. So this is the light map, the only light map you're, you're actually scoring. So the light map, I go through the light map. We can't use this, the first UV set that the artist mapped because it's just too many shells in there. So we have to do the same thing as we did in Brazil. We have to create a second UV set in some way. But the second UV set needs to generate this really low res light map because this house, we can only afford a type like 8 or 16 times 16 texture for this light map. For mirror sets, we have maybe a 1024 times 1024 texture for light map for this one. For this system to be able to handle the dynamic updates of this, this texture needs to be very small. So we have to simplify the second UV set texture. So what we have to do is we have to move all these shells to a simpler area. Try to explain this more. So if, here we can see all the geometry. There's a lot of edges everywhere. But the basic form of this house could be actually just be a cube almost, to, because all of the diffuse light is so diffuse. Of course. <laughs> uh, so here's the here's the artist's UV set. This is what he used to map this object. He of course makes several uh, materials in Maya, but this is the basic first UV set. So as I said, we have an off-axis. We know what we also map a normal map to this one. So we simplify this geometry because, as I said, we need to make this a lot smaller. So we simplify this so we have a target geometry. So we first have our, like, the artist map uh, object, what we call the detailed geometry. Then we have a target geometry. This target geometry is not used in the game. It's just used to move these shells to a simpler area in the light. So here's the UV set we create for this simplified geometry. So what we have to do, and this is not artist controlled, what happens here is that we, we take these target geometry and the detail geometry and we analyze this. And then we take all the shells from the first UV set in our detail geometry and move the shells into these areas. So on the left side we have the, the artist first UV set and on the left side we have a target geometry. So I have to take all these shells from the left side and move to this area so it fits exactly where it is. So it looks like this. So now we've actually moved the shells from, from the first UV set, created a second UV set on our detail geometry that looks like the target geometry. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to do that by hand? No, this is uh, done automatically. We, we de this is the only baking we do. We actually do a baking phase for an item. And that is to do this generation of moving these shells. Because we don't want to do the artists moving the shells themselves. So here we see the light map for this house. This is every square is one pixel. And when we now have, so we have our detailed geometry with the second UV set that are placed in the simplified geometry. Then we did just in the pipeline in real time, we just put that light map that gets automatically generated in the second UV set that we use to put our light maps in the reception, for example. So this light map gets created automatically and is placed in the second UV set. And if it's correctly moved, if it's, uh, all the shots are correctly placed, 
it works perfectly. I zoomed it out a bit here. You can see that all the what happens is that a lot of surfaces just get uh, squashed together. And that's fine because the light map, as, as I said, is so diffused because it's all in the red light. So the light probe geometry. So what we do is we have to store the lighting information for the dynamic and small objects, as I said. <coughs> so we place these light probe grids in the world to just say, in this place, we want to know how all the lighting is in the surrounding, basically. So here I actually bake the scene, and here we see all the light maps for the objects, and all the smaller objects that are in this scene, you can't see, because they're using these spheres that represents this graphic representation of what the lighting is around it. So you see the, the spheres underneath here gets darker, and some of them have light from sides, is the stored information for all the dynamic objects. Now, they don't need to be dynamic. They could be static objects also, that can use this there to optimize memory. Because a lot of objects actually aren't destructible, but pretty small, basically. And they can also use this lighting. Sometimes they're pretty gray and don't need to bounce light that much. So here you see our favorite graphics. So as I said, we have, to, we, have, we have to analyze all the geometry first and move these shells correctly. And we also, when this is done, we have to take all the light probe grids and all the light probes that are in our level and actually analyze the pixels everywhere. It's like a friendship uh, interaction between all the pixels. There's one pixel that knows about this pixel. So when this pixel gets a light, I'm going to send some of the light I got uh, further on to this one. But then all the light probes also need to know exactly, okay, where are all these pixels? Every light probe needs, uh, knows where all the pixels is around it. So we have to bake some. But this takes about 20 minutes to bake. And when you've done that, and you're not moving any static geometry, you can put in light probe geometry you can put in point lights and do whatever. You don't have to bake anything because everything dynamically updates. So the only time we have to do some baking at all is when you're placing a static geometry in the world that needs to... Look, so the light probe needs to know about it, basically. And it's around the geometry. So, uh, this is how the runtime lighting pipeline is. Uh, the complete render file looks like this. First, we update light maps and light probes on the CPU. Next, we run the geometry pass where all the bounce lights from the light maps and the light probes are separate uh, in the G buffer, which we encode in the log LGV. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows what that log LGV is. It's the packing of the 32 bit RGB and the R texture that actually is the packed HDR texture for all the light maps. Uh, the texture that we encode the HDR high dynamic range <coughs> we do so to save memory and performance. Finally, in the light pass, we first render all the deferred lights and then we add in the indirect light from the deep buffer. It's actually very simple, uh, but you need deferred rendering because you need all these G buffers to do this. So something I was talking about before was the, the, the environment map, basically. And what we do then, again with deferred rendering, we use one of our G buffers to store a texture that are projected everywhere that says how much of light every surface sees. So the red here sees 100% of sky. That means that we put the environment map that are outside of the world. And everything that is black takes in the texture that we've, the, the environment map we've set to be in this area. Basically. So we can, in the surfaces, actually see the change from the outdoor environment map to the indoor environment map. So here we can see, I have test of this, that this object here has the outdoor environment map and this fades into the indoor environment map. So we're taking a 
pretty big chunk of the default rendering to do this, but it's very important. I had to fight a bit with the coders to get this. The other thing, as I said, you can see the skylight. We have to make a, uh, a representation of how the sky looks for the world. And we can't just we, we can't just take the sky texture or the, or the, or the, spheric, uh, the sphere basically from the sky and then just send it out. So we have to do a, a uh, environment cross, you see on the left side, that's a representation of what the sky looks like. It's actually a light probe also, it's the exact data of what the light probe has. So it's like we made a, lots of small light probes and then we made a huge one that actually just says this is the light that comes from the sky. So I have to do one that represents the sky basically for all the light. And it looks something like this, the sky box thing. I have to put, I put the sky, I do the sky and I put it in the level. And then I have to do this sky box thing. I have, I have the sky box color to do this visual, visible uh, representation of the sky box. So the terrain. The terrain actually <coughs> uses the light map also, but they are generated basically depending on how big the, the terrain patches. And what we do here, we don't want to place light probe everywhere by hand as we do on the smaller levels. So we, we look at all the patches basically, and we see how many patches we're using, and we're, we, can, we can place in this picture, you see all the red dots here, is the place where we put the light probe. And we move it up, like, like one meter up the ground, and we put the light on there. That means when the character runs around in this terrain, it will try to interpolate between all these light probes. Objects. We don't have to place all these light probes that are being generated automatically depending on the patches. And also the patches.